I grew up, you know, in a you know great family. My parents uh, were from rural Alabama. Uh, both of my parents didn't go to college until after we were born, but they both were the only ones in their families to go to college uh, because education was really important to them. It wasn't they didn't want to go to college; they couldn't afford it, and there weren't opportunities. Uh, then, when I remember, I was like five years old. My mother had me in a room like this. Uh, at school with her, right, um, in class while she was getting her RN. And then when I went to college, my mother went back to college the same fall that I did to get her bachelor's degree and then subsequently got her master's degree. So um, education was always something uh, that was important to my parents. My father got his accounting degree and probably took him 20 years later to get his CPA, but it was always something that was expected of us, not something that uh, was an option. That was my growing up. And then when I was trying to decide what I was going to do for college, I actually, um, as one of my activities, had been taking piano lessons since I was four years old. And so my mo I wanted to major in music. And my father was like, you yeah, know, <laughs> what? Like, no. What do you mean, no? He's like, you're not living with us for the rest of your life. You need a real job. So I. Um, was like, all right, my brother was an engineer, and I thought he was in engineering school at Auburn, and I was like, well, okay, engineering sounds good. Let's do that. So you finished that up, but you decided to go on for another degree. I did, quickly. and one of my mentors was like, hey, listen, you might like this planning thing, so try it out. And I was like, okay. Uh, uh, so I applied to planning school, and my sister was actually at the University of Massachusetts, and um, her husband was an administrator there. At Amherst? At, Am at Amherst. And so I was like, all right, I got in, let's go. So I moved to Amherst and did the degree there. And when I came out, there were literally six planning jobs in the entire United States, entry-level planning jobs. And I was like, oh, this, gonna, this might be problematic because I can't go right back to school again. So <laughs> uh, I guess I better hustle and try to get one of these jobs. And I got one of them. Uh, it was in Knoxville, Tennessee. It helped that I went to Vanderbilt, so um, I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. Anybody ever been a neighborhood community planner before? No? Well, listen, your first thing when you go to community meetings is just people stand at a microphone and just cuss you out. So after like two of those meetings, you can imagine with my personality, I was like, this is not going to work for me. So uh, I said, so I, I actually remember going like, this has got to be something different. So I was like, all right, um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, first of all, we're going to change the format of all the meetings going forward because it's like getting screamed at and yelled at thing is not working for me. So you have 20 minutes to yell at the beginning of the meeting. So at 20 minutes is over. No, no more yelling, no more screaming, no more complaining. And it was actually a dramatic change in the way that um, uh, the community started to engage. And we ended up getting a lot of stuff done. So we actually won some awards for that uh, way of changing. And it actually, to this day, is still the way they do community planning in Knoxville. Which Fantastic. is pretty cool. Yeah. Little yeah. But then, um, you know, working for uh, $27,000 a year and working 24 hours a day wasn't really working for me in Knoxville, <laughs> Tennessee. So, like, that was cool, but now it's time to do something else. Uh, and there was a company that um, I had worked for or had interviewed with when I came out of school uh, named Hammer Siler George, and they did development consulting. And they called me and said, hey, we have a job would you like to consider coming uh, to be a, an assistant uh, consultant? And I was like, hmm, Knoxville, Washington, D.C.? I'm moving to D.C. Uh, and it was a phenomenal opportunity because I was the planner who was the translator between all the engineers and all the developers to help them all stay on the same page, uh, which was an, a phenomenal uh, opportunity. But I... You know, um, one of these people was like processing things. I'm like, so I'm making now $35,000 a year, but you developer guys are over there making like $100,000 a year. And I'm still like, what? Yeah, I could do that job. Uh, and so I asked one of my mentors, I was like, what would it take for me to become a developer? And he was like, well, you can either go work for one of them and start at the bottom. Anybody who knew it was real estate, the bottom isn't, doesn't pay a lot. Uh, at least it didn't back then. Or you can go back to school. And I was like, school? Wait, I have a master's. What are you talking about? Uh, and they said, you know, he was like, look, you can, you can go back. You're still young enough. It'll be actually, you'll be surprised. It's going to open up a whole lot more op options for you. And so I was like, all right, well, let me do my homework. And so I decided that going back to get an MBA was the right thing for me. Okay. And you selected Wisconsin, the real so estate area? So I did. Uh, I applied, and I got into all the schools I applied to, which was awesome. And 
so there were a couple things that I was like, I got to make a decision. I'm a, like one of these list people who like writes down kind of the things I want. And I'm like, okay, how do these things measure up? It's probably the engineer in me. I need to go visit the schools and I need to kind of like talk to some of the alumni because this is all about like what's going to happen on the other end. I really don't believe that there's that much difference between what you learn in the classroom. I think it's about the relationships that you build and about what the school can do for you in terms of like your future. So I um, remember calling up to the center here, the real estate center, and they said, oh, well, you know, we got plenty of alumni real estate alumni in DC, and so let me call the representative and have him get in touch with you. So uh, they called, he called me, he was like, listen, it was Nick Yonke. So Nick Yonke calls me and he's like, Susan, um, would love to take you to lunch. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Let me go talk to Nick Yonke about Wisconsin. I'm thinking I'm go go to lunch with him. If nothing else, get a free lunch. So um, I go to lunch with Nick, and when I showed up, there were 20 alums there. And I was like, wait, I thought you said that it was like lunch with me and you, Nick. He was like, well, I just, you know, told people that you were thinking about going and they all decided they wanted to come and have lunch as well. So, <laughs> hey, there you go. And I was like, okay, I see you. Um, uh, so, and then I went to visit the other school and let's just be really clear, that did not happen. <laughs> and then when they like told me how much money I was gonna get, I was like, yeah, okay. I think I'm going to Wisconsin. Fantastic. So I'd like to jump ahead and before going into more of the jobs to really touch on that public uh, director. You're a, a director at Potbelly and you've been on Potbelly's board since 2014. I have, which what's, is, what's um, that been like? and it's also interesting because like I'm totally not the mold of like a corporate director, yeah. right? The, the, the mold is um, typically been a 55 year old plus white man who's retiring, uh, whose friends have been on the board, who invite him to come be on the board. And if you actually look across corporate directors across um, the country, you see that the numbers are still pretty paltry when it comes to the number of women on boards and the number of minorities on boards. So um, I, I call it right place, right time, which I think happens a lot. Uh, you know, Oprah has this thing where she says, you know, being lucky is just preparation meets opportunity. And so for me, it was about the preparation first and the opportunity would come if I kept doing what I need to do. So I put some feelers in the marketplace that I was interested. And so a couple of opportunities came to me. Uh, and then the third opportunity that came was Potbelly. And the reason why it was attractive to me is because it was a small company. It was growing like crazy. They had just gone public. They were transitioning from the equity direct owners to independent directorship. And I felt like, look, if I, if you want to get into a company where you can literally be a part of the growth of the company as a director, this is the, the kind of place you want to be. So with all these opportunities, why do you stay at American Express Company? Look, you know, um, I, I have a simple formula for success for me in terms of where I want to be. One is, do they have a demonstrated track record of giving people the opportunity to do different things? That's the first thing. So. Um, at Amex, um, I've done something that almost nobody else candidly has done, which is move from a pure operations role to running a P&L, which I asked for, by the way, um, to now running digital. The, the second thing which is really important is um, do, they, do they have a demonstrated track record of sponsoring people who look like me and who are like me, right? Because you can't progress through any corporation without sponsorship. I don't care what anybody tells you. So, and this is especially for the ladies in the audience because I see women in my office all the time who are like, oh my God, Susan, I just, I've done everything. I've just put my head down and I've just worked. Well, guess what? That's why you don't have a promotion. So um, the thing is, is like, it's all about relationships and how you manage relationships and the work is table stakes and how people perceive your ability to influence and move the needle is really what's gonna give you the opportunity to move to that next level. And the third thing is, can I be myself, right? Because I don't, um, I, I see uh, executives in some companies who like literally you see them like on Saturday, they're one person, you see them in the office, they're a totally different person. And I'm like, I cannot imagine how much energy it takes for that to happen. You know, my mother always used to say to me, uh, it's really hard to send your representative to the table for a long period of time because eventually they're going to find you out and they may not like you. So be yourself. 